you're graduating. Your parents are proud, you're relieved, but now what? Where are you going? How about a college where you won't get overwhelmed and still get the full college experience? Great. Let's start at Rose State. Rose State starts you out with a choice from more than 60 degrees and certificate programs. And Rose State offers compelling value in its two-year degrees. Consider the Rose State graduate feedback in a recent survey. 95% of recent Rose State graduates are employed. 95% would recommend Rose State to a friend. And 97% would get their associate degree if they had to do it all over again. But don't worry. Students at Rose State are so much more than just a number. We'll help you along the way. With smaller class sizes, you can enjoy a hands-on academic lifestyle with a friendly, engaging, and experienced staff. With Oklahoma's first urban community college housing, you can live on campus and enjoy a bustling student life, from sports to an award-winning performing arts center. But at the end of the day, it's all about you and where you want to go. So what are you waiting for? Get started. Rose State College. Going somewhere starts here. All right. Welcome to Great Debates, Power, Politics, and People. Well, welcome everyone to this uh, first of our fall series of the Great Debates, uh, People, Politics, and Power. Uh, today's panel is going to be regarding free speech, and I forgot I'm supposed to hold the mic uh, because if not we get some feedback, so I'm going to do that. I was told to do that, all right. That is correct, right, Tyler? Hold the mic, all right. Uh, before we get started, I want to um, uh, acknowledge and thank some people, all right. Uh, we do have Dr. Francis Hendricks, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, is with us today, uh, as, long, as well as Dr. Juanita Ortiz and Dr. Aaron Batchoffer, the Dean and Associate Dean of the Social Sciences Division. They're way in the back. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here as well. Uh, thanks to all the students who are here. We're glad to have you uh, and excited about uh, discussing this topic with you. Um, in addition, I want to thank uh, the staff of the Social Sciences Division uh, that have provided a great deal of support for this series. 
Um, we've actually, this is, we're starting our fourth year of this series, uh, and uh, the division staff, Tanera Jackson and Mary Vick, have been uh, it, it, crucial to being able to do all the logistics surrounding uh, these events, so I appreciate that as well. I um, want to mention Travis Hurst. You can't see him right now, but uh, Travis is the coordinator for our uh, education technology here at Rose State College, uh, and he handles all of the video, all of the recording, all of the, the sound, it's, it, all of this logistic stuff that's right here, right now. Uh, Travis handles all of that. He has been uh, exceptional to partner with on this, this project. Um, I also need to thank our funding partners. Uh, we, this project uh, for the last three years has received a grant from the John Templeton Foundation administered through the Institute for Humane Studies uh, in support of bringing diverse viewpoints uh, on important topics to our students. Uh, and we greatly appreciate the support of those funding partners. They have been outstanding to work with and I really want to tell them thank you as well. Um, the topic that we're going to be talking about today uh, is free speech. And if you haven't been paying attention in the news lately, there's been a lot to discuss about this topic. Um, one of the reasons we've changed the, the format of these slightly is that rather than just having kind of a, a, a stilted format where people give generalized comments, I really wanted to make sure that we offered a variety of perspectives on topics and that people could see and hear an exchange of ideas uh, in a setting that people weren't shouting at one another. Uh, and I think sometimes in our political discourse we've forgotten that you can actually have a disagreement without yelling and shouting and having a temper tantrum. We seem to have forgotten that in some sense. Uh, and so I wanted to offer us an opportunity to, to do that. So what that means for you guys is that uh, throughout this fall semester, when we have these, there are going to be a lot of smart people uh, explaining to you why I don't really know what I'm talking about. All right? Uh, and well, maybe they'll just explain where my arguments need a little tweaking or uh, need some additional insight. But the point is, in an age where people are increasingly, at least seemingly, becoming more hostile and violent, we need to see, you as students need to see, that people can disagree with one another about various topics, but still do so in a way that fosters understanding and critical thinking. We can disagree while working to find common ground. Uh, too much for what passes for political discourse in our country today is little more than people, as I said, yelling at one another. There's no real communication, no real dialogue, and certainly no attempt to find common ground. Uh, and this is not good for a democratic republic. It's not good at all. Uh, so today, each of our panelists is going to exercise their freedom of speech uh, in exploring this topic. And we hope uh, we will be responding to one another uh, with a goal, as I said, of fostering understanding, treating each other with mutual respect, and trying to find both points of agreement and disagreement. So let me introduce to you to our distinguished panel. I think they're distinguished anyway. I have it right here. All right. I'll start on my far left, Mr. Brady Henderson. Uh, he has been a member of the Oklahoma legal community since 2006. Uh, Mr. Henderson is a former district attorney, and he managed his own law practice before joining the ACLU in 2012, where he is now the legal director for the ACLU of Oklahoma. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from the University of Oklahoma with degrees in political science and letters, and he earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of Oklahoma Law School in 2006. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Brady Henderson. <laughs> Next we have Mr. Arnold Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton is a veteran journalist, veteran journalist. Uh, former staff writer for the Dallas Morning News, the San Ho Jose Mercury News, the Dallas Times Herald, and the Oklahoma Journal. Much of his career is focused on covering American politics and government, and he's been a full-time state capital correspondent in Oklahoma, Texas, California. Uh, anywhere else? Did no, I get them all? Okay. All right. That's enough. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hamilton is a two-time winner of the Dallas Press's Club's Katie Award for Reporting Excellence, and he also earned the Fran Morris Civil Liberties in Media Award from the American Civil Liberties Union of Oklahoma, Foundation of Oklahoma. Uh, his reporting has been recognized by the American Society of News and the Associated Press Sports Editors, 
and Mr. Hamilton was inducted into the Oklahoma Journalism Hall of Fame in 2011. Welcome, Mr. Hamilton. <laughs> to my left is Darcy Delaney. Professor Delaney is a professor of mass communications uh, here at Rose State College and the 15th Street News Advisor. Uh, she began her journalistic career at the age of 13 by submitting stories to her local newspaper. She went on to work for her high school and college newspapers, radio stations, and online publications and campus TV news programs. Professor Delaney earned her associate's degree in journalism from right here at Rose State College, uh, and then went on to earn her bachelor's degree in journalism and mass communication with a minor in sociology. Uh, from the University of Oklahoma, and she earned her master's degree from the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communications, also at OU. Uh, Ms. Delaney has been a staff writer at the Sun newspaper in Midwest City, where she worked for three years. She also served as public relations and communications specialist for a software company from 2010 to 2015. Please welcome Professor Darcy Delaney. <laughs> and to my right, far right, is Dr. Elizabeth Overman. Uh, Dr. Overman is a professor of public policy and administration at the University of Central Oklahoma, where she earned the new Faculty Member of the Year Award in 2013. Dr. Overman's teaching and research interests focus on policy analysis, nonprofit management, and social disparities. Dr. Overman also serves on the editorial board and as a reviewer for the inter interdisciplinary academic journal, The Researcher. Uh, the, in addition, Dr. Overman has served fellowships at the United States Military Academy in West Point. There's so much here, I had to have a second page. Uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the New York University Ford Foundation and the U.S. Army Combat Studies Institute. Dr. Overman earned a Certificate of Excellence from the American Democracy Project and a Certificate of Excellence from Students for an Accessible Society. She's had articles published in the International Journal of Humanities and the researcher. Dr. Overman earned her bachelor's in political science and master's in social sciences at the University of Colorado, and she earned her master's in history and her PhD in public policy and administration from Jackson State University. Please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Overman. All right, now on to the main event. All right. Um, I'm going to start with a, a rather lengthy quote from John Stuart Mill. When I think about free speech, I usually go straight to, to him. And so I'm going to start with that, uh, where he said, the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it's robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion, still more than those who hold it. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If the opinion is wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, a clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. There's been a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of mistrust of free speech that we have seen, uh, not just over the last weekend, although there was some evidence of that uh, just this last weekend, but over the last couple of years, we've seen instances, especially on college campuses, uh, where uh, there have been collisions of ideas. And these collisions of ideas have not been this kind of interchange and dialogue, but they have been, in some cases, violent. They have been, in some cases, ugly to watch and, and hard to watch. Um, a lot of this does stem, I think, from a, a lack of understanding about free speech. Uh, there was a Brookings Institution survey that was just recently released that asked students about their impressions of the First Amendment and free speech issues. Uh, just a few of the results of that speech that I thought was, was both disturbing and certainly relevant for our conversation. Uh, a majority of the students that were surveyed were unfamiliar with the First Amendment's protection of controversial speech, even hate speech. Um, a majority of the respondents believed it was acceptable to interrupt and shout down a speaker invited to a campus that that student group disliked. Uh, approximately one in five of the students surveyed believed that the use of violence to suppress disfavored speech was an appropriate response. Uh, and a majority of the students preferred a learning environment in which controversial speech was prohibited rather than one in which they were exposed to all sorts of views. We've seen 
just recently in Charlottesville, uh, the clash of this kind of, of speech and composing ideas that became very ugly where uh, people did resort to violence uh, to try to solve their disputes, or not solve their disputes, but to win the day is more like what was occurring. Um, we have colleges creating free speech zones. Uh, there was an example of a community college in California that uh, told a student who was trying to pass out copies of the Constitution in Spanish that not only could they not do that, but if they had a permit to do it, they could only do so on a very small sliver of the campus property. Um, you have over, overly broad definitions uh, and applications of what are, are, have become known as microaggressions, which are real, but sometimes we have seen campuses go a little overboard in trying to uh, protect against those. And we, as we have noted, have an increasing use of violence to shut down disfavored speech. I think first, we ought to define what free speech is. I think that's an important place to start. And traditionally, we have defined free speech as that speech which is not subject to government sanction or punishment. Um, there are some exceptions to this, and I'm sure Mr. Henderson can, can talk about these more fully uh, uh, in, a, in a little bit, but uh, obviously speech that incites what the Supreme Court has called imminent lawless action is not free speech uh, protected by the First Amendment. Obscenity, uh, and however the court defines that, uh, is not protected under the First Amendment, and libel and slander are not protected. Um, past those limited exclusions, though, the court has been very, I would say, aggressive in protecting all manner of speech and all manner of environments. Um, what does this not guarantee you? Well, it doesn't guarantee you that you will have a venue or a mechanism to deliver your speech, right? You, you're not promised a public forum in which to express your ideas. Uh, nor are you promised access to the media to do so. Um, you are not protected from social reaction to your speech, uh, which can include everything from counter protest and alternative presentations, public criticism, boycotts, all of these we have seen used as reactions to speech that members of the public have found uh, inappropriate. It also doesn't protect you from necessarily from private reaction to your speech. Um, if you go out uh, and get on social media and trash your employer uh, and walk into the, your office the next day uh, and they fire you, they have not violated your free speech rights. Uh, and we have seen this happen uh, in a couple of situations uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, it doesn't protect you from, um, you know, being shunned by friends and family, these types of things either. So saying that you have the right to speak your mind uh, does not limit other people's ability to react to what you have said. Uh, and I think sometimes we've forgotten that, uh, that we don't appreciate that. Now, I want to talk about this, this third point that, because this is where I have become more concerned. I haven't seen the Supreme Court uh, yet backing away from its protections of speech. But I've seen some things that I find disconcerting, and I don't know if, if the rest of you will, will uh, find these or not, in this kind of social reaction. Um, again, I'm going to refer back to, to John Stuart Mill, uh, who said, when society is itself the tyrant, its means of tyrannizing are not restricted to the acts which it may do by the hands of its political functionaries. Society can and does execute its own mandates, and if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in areas where it shouldn't, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression. Some things that I've thought about in relation to this, um, the kneeling at the, the NFL games by certain players, and uh, the the pushback, uh, especially against uh, kind of the person who's seen as the originator of this, uh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, who has had trouble finding an NFL team to hire him. Uh, I wonder if that, you know, is, is taking someone's livelihood and, and punishing that, is that appropriate or not? I, I have questions about that. We saw this a few years back with uh, Brandon Ike, who was the former uh, CEO of Mozilla, who was forced out of his position because uh, many in California disliked a political cause that he had contributed to. And I wonder, is that, 
has society become too aggressive in trying to shut down speech? This is a concern that I have. And we always see, I'm sure Dr. Overman has seen this, um, uh, but we always see various calls for firing certain professors who say something controversial, right? Uh, I've seen this from the left and the right, both. Uh, a, a professor says something, sometimes what they're said is taken out of context, and all of a sudden there's a huge effort, we should fire this person. And, and that, to me, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that kind of reaction. I don't, I don't know. So with that being said, I'm going to kind of open this up to hear from our panelists' thoughts on this topic, where you'd like to take this. Anything that you think uh, I should have included or that I wasn't considering as I was making my comments. So I'm going to hand this over to you guys now for a minute. So does anybody want to jump in first? I'm going to, you might have to sit up a little bit. Oh, that's fine. Um, I want to thank you for holding this. I think this is a great time to discuss this issue um, in this lovely new building that you have. Um, I just wanted to say that free speech is actually a natural a natural result of natural law and it goes back to our early early beginnings and in fact you can in the west we go back to Greece maybe we should go back to Egypt but we go back to Greece where uh, Alexander the Great was criticized um, for uh, blocking the Sun and which meant that he was criticized for blocking other people's views of what was happening and he was doing this by curbing free speech. And because the ability to speak is inherent in our nature, uh, some scholars have examined free speech from the perspective of power and politics and how the d when the powerful begin to take control, they begin to want to control the speech of people in the social formations. So I just wanted to start off with that. Awesome. Anybody want to jump in? All right, go ahead. Don't be shy. I'll try. I'll see if I can. There we go. That's better. Um, I, I think that you know a couple of comments that that I think of in hearing what you say, Professor. I mean, one, if if there's anything there in which I might disagree a little bit, it's it's I think something you said about the idea that you know we're not necessarily guaranteed a forum for our, our ideas, and I absolutely understand where you're coming from, but I also think that in some ways what often we do in court with the First Amendment does deal with what are called traditional public forums. And it's actually important to understand in American law that there's a tradition where some places are considered always public forums for speech. And the idea kind of goes back, Professor, to what you were saying about natural law in a way, that the idea is these are places that have always been places people speak. So I'm talking about things like parks, sidewalks, the steps of a government building perhaps. Um, it can actually get a little bit difficult when you're looking at specific facts of always exactly where does a public forum start or end. But one of the things that very often we deal with is that exact concern. And most of the time that works very well. The problem comes when, you know, what happens when you have two or more very different speakers who both decide, I want to use this public forum at the same time. That's when things get very, very difficult. And in fact, we live in an age now where more and more cities are grappling, counties, states are grappling with this problem. And some of what we've seen with things like the alt-right movement, Charlottesville, Antifa, is you've got folks who want to literally lock arms. You've got protesters and counter-protesters who they don't want to be a mile away from each other. They want to be right there. They want to be having this very direct discourse. And that can obviously create some danger. And it's created some real consequences. And so I think that's one of the things that's really going to define the next many years of what free speech law is all about. And when we talk about traditional public forums, I think it, it's important to think back to our founders here. And this connects back to the idea of free speech zones that many campuses have established, for instance. There's a very long history to free speech zones. And I say that because one of the first in America was created by the framers of the Constitution and the ratifiers of the First Amendment and it's the entire United States. I mean, that was very much what they sought to do, is they said, this is the country we're gonna have, the entire country will be a free speech zone. That's the tradition in which we operate. 
everything else that has happened since is often in carving out exceptions, exemptions, ways in which you actually execute that doctrine. But the tradition of America is all about free speech. It's not a perfect tradition. It's a tradition that includes uh, something called the Alien and Sedition Acts, for you history buffs, that were passed but a few years after the Constitution that outlawed sedition, which essentially is speaking out against the government, um, in a sense. It's not very consistent with the First Amendment. We're the country that gave the world McCarthyism. Um, so we don't have a perfect tradition here by any means, but I think it's against that backdrop that we have to think about everything else that's happening now. We can go from one side to the other, if that's, if that's all right. Um, you know, it seems like things are worse today or maybe more contentious than they've ever been. But, but I will tell you, as someone who grew up in the 60s, and yes, I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to come across as the geezer on the couch up here today. But, um, you know, that was a pretty rough and tumble time uh, in this country as well. And I, I've been giving this a lot of thought anyway, James, as we discussed, that... Uh, uh, be because it seems like this is the first time that we've sort of seen encouragement from the White House uh, for this sort of conflict in American society. You know, presidents typically uh, attempt to calm the waters in this country, and instead we seem to have uh, almost a WWE-esque, you know, uh, approach thanks to Twitter uh, from this from this president but the reality is is that we've seen this over the years we saw it a lot in uh, um, the civil rights uh, era we, we saw a lot in uh, the Vietnam War protests in the 60s we saw head-to-head -head, <laughs> head knocking <laughs> battles on the streets of, of American cities uh, and and actually um, Many of you all may not remember or have seen footage. I've seen some actually just recently on this that was a reminder to me, because I had forgotten this, that uh, Richard Nixon, when he was in the White House, actually invited, he called it, I think, the hard hat crew, if I remember correctly. And they were uh, sort of burly union guys who showed up in New York City to confront anti-war protesters. And the union guys showed up with pipes and other weaponry and you know there was an all-out war and brawl and and Nixon who had you know was sort of pursuing that law and order theme that he was playing to his base not unlike Donald Trump today is uh, uh, invited those folks to the White House so this is not necessarily new what what concerns me I guess in in this day and age I, I've always argued as a writer particularly that words have meaning and Quite honestly, I'm not sure what a lot of words that we use today actually mean. And I would, we could even go into politics and say, you know, what does conservative mean today? What does liberal mean today? Uh, it, 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 it seems to mean different things to different people. And, and so one of the things that, that I've been mulling after reading your outline and, and so forth is, um, what's the difference in the minds of many Americans between free speech and hate speech uh, it's it seems to me it's often in the eye of the beholder and when you when we're all in our silos where we sort of tend to congregate with people who think like we think whether it's an online silo through Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be or whether it's a, a campus group or a church group or or whatever it might be we don't have a chance really to converse back and forth with people who might think a little bit differently and we might actually find that we have some common some common ground to share so it's it from that standpoint it's very uh, disconcerting to me because I think you see in that um, uh, Brookings uh, research you know if you have one in five folks your age basically who think it's okay to knock heads as opposed to try to talk through issues you know that's very worrisome to me I think we're obviously headed into a, perhaps an even more volatile time unless we can find a way to bridge that gap and, and begin to talk to one another again 
Um, I, I was actually going to point out the same thing. I, I, I try to teach my students that truth and objectivity are the most crucial things, but at the same time they have to realize there's repercussions for, for speaking their mind and putting um, things out there. Uh, you can't walk around just saying whatever you want to say and not expect that people are going to have an opinion about it. Um, I think we see this with social media a lot with the uh, election. There was a lot of people posting things and they were getting frustrated when people were going against what they said. And uh, we just, the most important thing is to realize that other people have opposing viewpoints. And like you said, to create a dialogue that we can actually, in a platform to share and not um, just delete everybody that doesn't have our opinion, have selective exposure to that um, and just consume what we uh, agree with. And so we should be consuming other media and um, hearing other viewpoints and trying to understand and bridge that gap like what you were saying. So I'm in complete agreement with what you were saying. Thank you. Um, Dr. Davenport, in your introduction, you mentioned the fact that we have free speech, but we don't have a, a public forum that guarantees that we can speak. But I want to suggest to you that we do because of the information technologies and that just like 9-11 changed the nature of warfare, for the first time civilians could actually carry out mass destruction using simple items, plane tickets, uh, box cutters, etc. And that um, Chelsea Manning actually precipitated change in the sense that the information that was regarded as secure was proliferated. And these were revolutions in our time. And that now, because of the information technology, we are in a period of a free speech revolution where literally everybody has a megaphone. I think that's a good point. I wonder, I wonder though, if that megaphone isn't part of the problem. And, I, you know, um, it's very cheap to set up a blog. You know, it's almost costless, right, to set up a blog and to say anything. Uh, and now, and, and while that is, that is certainly accessible, there's not a guarantee that anybody's going to read your blog, right? There's not a guarantee that, that, that you'll have influence. But there does seem obviously to be uh, many who do. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with the advent of Internet technology, of social media, uh, we've, we've seen the evolution of this idea of fake news. And since I have some journalism here, I'll get your impression of this. What, how do you define fake news? How do you, is, is it again just the thing of, well, it's information I don't like, so it's obviously fake, or is there really uh, entities out there perpetuating actual false information in some way? Uh, and what's, what is the counter to that? So let me throw that out there to, to either of you if you'd like to, to tackle that, that issue. Of I just think that with fake news is like, um, there are actual websites that go out and they, they develop fake news that's, that's um, there for a political agenda, for propaganda, whatever they want to do with it. Um, but they they look exactly like real news sites. I mean, they even create like branding on their, um, it, and I have to caution all my journalism students, like, you know, whenever you're trying to find a credible source, make sure that you look up who owns it, who owns the domain, what, where it's from. Um, we just went over that yesterday in class. So, you know, you have to be able to find credible and reliable sources um, of information. That's the same way with every one. You know, we're not looking at um, who's creating the content before we distribute it and repost it and share it with everyone. And we need to be more cautious when we're doing that. And like you said, like social media is such a big platform with a megaphone. Who was it who said that um, a lie can circle the globe five times before the truth gets its sneakers on? You know, I mean, it, that is really a problem today. And and quite frankly, I mean, I am I have a monthly publication as well as a website that, that goes with that. And it, it, a lot of information 
comes across my desk. I find a lot of things that I find interesting. And to have to sort of research the validity of all of it can be exhausting. And it's a full-time occupation for me. I can only imagine for someone who has a, a different career, uh, and my kids are grown and gone, so I don't have a family to, to worry about right now. It's, it's very difficult. It, it's created a situation, I think, almost in this country where we – Maybe we sort of know more than we've ever known before, but understand less than ever before um, because we just have all this information coming across the bow. And there are people for whom the truth simply does not matter. They're willing to create, and, and they've always been there. Look, you go back to the Revolutionary War days, there were pamphlets that, would be, that, in, you know, that people were printing and, and had little relationship to the truth either. Um, but there's just so much more of it out there now that it's, you know, it's a very, very difficult thing. And to me, you have to rely on the folks that have been around for a long time. They've sort of been the, uh, the trusted traditional news sources. You're not going to like everything that you see. Um, I I'm coming at it from the political left, and I disagree with things I read in the New York Times and the Washington Post and places like that that a lot of people in this part of the country might think are sort of, oh, the evil liberal, you know, establishment media in this country. Um, media people, I've been in daily journalism, I spent much of my career in daily journalism, we don't always get it right, but there are certain standards that we are held to that require us to come back in and correct things that we got wrong, uh, and that you, you can rely on that information for the most part. It's not always going to be perfect. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes we journalists focus on things that are really not the things we probably ought to be focused on. We, we're human beings. We miss the, we miss the, the, uh, the essential story, or it may, it may be weeks or months if it ever comes out. So... The problem is, is that you have, and, and this does, I think, come from the White House on down, but it, it feeds into a certain narrative that's been building on the extreme, particularly on the extreme far right, although there probably is some on the left that is so far out there that you need a telescope to see them, and I just don't follow them. But um, sort of this sense that if you, dis if you disagree with the reporting, that you're going to claim that it's fake news, it's false, and, you know, the problem is you keep telling the lie and you keep pounding that drum long enough, people, a lot of people sort of begin to believe it. It becomes conventional wisdom, even though, you know, ultimately all the complaining that we've seen from the White House or, or most of the complaining that we've seen from the White House uh, about stories that have been written, more and more information comes out and you can see now why they're trying to divert attention to other topics. So you have to be, as news consumers, you have to be extremely careful, and as journalists, even more careful not to take any of this stuff as conventional wisdom or to buy it hook, line, and sinker without investigating for yourself. I have a comment about, you were saying, um, you said something about we have more information than ever before, we, and we do, um, but I, I think that one of the things that, that we're seeing is a lot of watered down um, information and people are consuming that and I, we call it Big Mac Theory where you're consuming a lot of junk food um, your fun news or like things that we don't you know um, necessarily it's not in-depth articles like we were seeing in like the 60s and 70s um, we're seeing like bulleted list of stories and we're not getting the full um, scope of what's happening and we're, we're just not educated enough and then we retweet it, you know, and it's, we haven't even explored the whole story, so. I, I want to respond to that as a consumer of junk food. <laughs> a lot of junk food. Um, I don't eat Big Macs. I, I eat the single and in some cases double quarter pounder with cheese. Um, just going ahead and making that career for cardiologists later, you know. Um, I try not to consume, though, the media version of junk food as much as possible, but I, I absolutely agree. I think that's a lot of the problem. And 
one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is that part of protected speech under the First Amendment, in many cases, is false speech, is lies. And that's something a lot of folks don't realize, that not in all circumstances, but at least in some, literally getting up and lying can be protected First Amendment speech. Part of what's very different, I think, that, that we're seeing with Trump coming in and with everything going on around him and um, some of the social movements that are concomitant with that is a weaponization of distrust, a weaponization of those lies in a way that we haven't seen in America, I think, in a long time. It's not unprecedented. It's not a new idea. There are a lot of folks who've had this idea before to weaponize distrust and lies for political purposes, government purposes, and they run the gambit, too. I mean, this ranges from guys like Joseph Goebbels, um, one of Hitler's right-hand men, very brilliant, brilliant individual at weaponizing lies and distrust, to Winston Churchill or FDR. Um, Joseph Stalin was a great weaponizer of distrust. You know, you've got people on kind of both ends of our sort of moral spectrum, <laughs> if you will, when we look back at history. And so you can look at things that somebody like Goebbels did or Stalin did and say, oh my gosh, this horrible way in which they used lies. And then we can look at the same time during World War II and say, oh, but here's this brilliant thing that FDR did or Churchill did to hide the Normandy invasion with all these fake news stories and fake army divisions that never existed and all this misinformation that succeeded in foiling the enemy's ability to know what we were doing. You know, so much of our perception of falsehood and whether or not it's good or bad speech, so to speak, is tied up in which side we're on. You know, does it happen to be something that is supporting what we believe is right? Or is it from an adversary or an enemy? That's the difficulty, too, in figuring out what to do about it. There are increasing calls now for levels of government or for private media sources, whether that's Facebook or Twitter itself, for instance, uh, media organizations that are professional veteran media organizations, to call out the stuff. There are increasing calls for Facebook to do more aggressive censorship of fake news. And one of the dangers in that is it's very hard to regulate that without sometimes getting into some very troublesome territory, as history shows us. And so I think it's important to not only think about that in context, but as a civil rights lawyer, I think that's one of the key places that First Amendment um, court cases are likely to go in the next many years, because it's a big deal. And because right now we have a government that wants to weaponize that distrust. And I think the point is, in the end, not so much to make people believe the lies. It's to make them not believe the truth. I mean, you look back at especially what folks like Churchill and FDR did. Um, it wasn't ever about, hey, we want to make sure the Nazis believe this exact thing is going to happen. No, it was we want them to look at all their intelligence and have no idea what's real and what's not. I truly believe that one of the things government loves to do when it decides that it wants to abuse power is that it likes to simply get people to turn the other way, to turn the news off, to turn the news sources off, to say, well, yeah, you know, I see that story that makes it look like this government official is really corrupt, but I, I don't know whether to believe it, and I just don't have the time to invest to worry about it. In other words, the weaponization right now is really about creating apathy. Apathy is, in a sense, I think, the ultimate weapon of bad government. Because if you can get citizens to be apathetic, you can do pretty much anything else you want to do, as long as you don't bother whatever is in that zone that people care about. And the smaller you can make that zone, the better. Which is also, I think, where we get back to siloing. And I want to comment briefly on, on the notion of, of the megaphone. <laughs> um, I think not only is, is there a megaphone that everybody gets, but actually the bigger danger with the way the internet has really come to develop, it's not so much that everybody's got a megaphone even as everybody's got their own echo chamber. Where it used to be that, you know, if I'm in an average community and I have really, really bizarre beliefs that probably need to be tested against some truth, I'm generally likely to only have a few people, if any, that I ever encounter that share them. I'm going to mostly encounter people who say, Brady, you are totally full of it. What in the hell are you thinking? And over time, that helps me to realize either that I need to shut up <laughs> or that I might be wrong. When I do all of that communication on the internet, 
and suddenly I'm communicating with people all over the world, I can find hundreds and thousands and maybe millions of people who, though they are tiny minorities wherever they are, suddenly create the sense that I'm part of this great movement, right? Oh my gosh, everybody must think this. And that goes right back to how much of our social media works. My Facebook, when I go on it, isn't the same Facebook that you see or you see. It's defined by what searches I run, by what friends I have, by what content I want. And it's not just Facebook. If I go to CNN, the same thing happens. If I go to CBS News, the same thing happens. If I go to the Wall Street Journal site, I see what computer algorithms think I want to see. And that's really dangerous in our democracy when virtually all of our sources of information tend to run that way. And so I think the siloing um, is as dangerous as the weaponization of distrust. In fact, I think it's one of the means by which that weaponization has, has had its impact. I agree with you about sort of apathy is cultivated in certain quarters. I would like to suggest right now that the President of the United States, as a f recent candidate, is deliberately trying to provoke people and get them into the streets to fight each other. And look at the response to Charlottesville. Look at, he's trying to, to get people to um, take on athletes who are uh, using their free speech rights in a symbolic manner. And look at the conventions where it was kill her, jail her. I mean, it was right back to Nuremberg. Well, I, I don't disagree with you on that. I, I, I do pose the question, to what end? And, and I'm going to proffer a, an answer to that. Uh, which is uh, you have a president who on many fronts wants to change the story right now. He wants to divert our attention from uh, Russia and the influence uh, in the elections, um, what's happening uh, in Puerto Rico, um, uh, what's happening in terms of all the suddenly, amazingly, how many people in the White House are using private email servers and uh, after they chanted, lock her up, lock her up, through the 2016 presidential election? Isn't that fascinating that that's taking place? So I think there's a lot of, he's, Trump, Trump is brilliant on this uh, in terms of diverting attention, but that's what happened, you know, this is a messy Politics is messy. The public square is messy. That's the American way. It, it just is. We are constantly sit on the precipice of being offended by somebody's speech, I think, in this country. And yet, I'm willing to do that, to accept that as a price of living in this country, rather than having somebody start drawing those artificial lines that you were mentioning, because your lines are probably not going to be the same lines that my lines are going to be. Of course, mine are right, but 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 still, you know, on the off chance that somebody else gets a hold of that marker, you know, I, I want to be protected. And I hope and pray that we continue to have a court system in this country that stands firm and strong and tries to, as best it can, to interpret the Constitution in a fair way without fear or favor and without influence by, from the economic powers that be in this country. You went somewhere, both of you went somewhere I wanted to, to go, uh, mainly because there's too much agreement on here and, and we're having too much of a kumbaya moment and we, we need to argue a little bit more. But um, one, of the, one of the controversial things that has emerged uh, has been the issue of uh, NFL players' reactions uh, to uh, what they have viewed as injustice within society and this idea of, of kneeling during the national anthem at, at, at football games. One of the things that you said that prompted me, and I, as I was saying, I said, he's right on, is this has prompted a whole bunch of disagreement on terms like patriotism, like justice, 
uh, terms like, you know, how, how do you appropriately respond to injustice? All of these things, and what I've seen emerge in conversation after conversation on this is people don't agree about those things at all. Uh, you have people who, who make the argument, no, you know, it's our anthem, and it's, it's about America, freedom, all of this, and you should honor that, and that's patriotism. And the other people are like, patriotism is recognizing when something's wrong and doing something about it. And, um, and this is where rights kind of conflict a little bit, I think, right? Um, you have the point of it is certainly the right of an individual to to refuse. I mean, we've had Supreme Court cases that said you can't make students say the Pledge of Allegiance. You can't make, you know, this kind of thing. So we know inherently uh, we have these rights. NFL owners of these entities have rights of protecting their image and, and their branding and, and this type of thing. And so, you know, how do you square, how do I make a decision? I'm looking at these controversies. Who's right in this? Who's wrong in this and why? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let, I'm, I'm looking at you. So I'm gonna let you start. This is a, this is messy. Uh, I, I don't know how else to put it because you know, let's think about this just a minute. There's, there's. Colin Kaepernick is not a Super Bowl winning quarterback at this stage in his career, probably. But people who follow this a lot more closely than I say he could certainly help a lot of teams in the NFL. But he was essentially blackballed for taking a stand on something. He wanted to bring attention to what he saw as, you know, bad things that police were doing to African Americans in this country. Um, and yet, NFL owners will sign and continue to hang on to sexual abusers, drug users, armed robbers, you know, who they've concluded their team needs in order to compete for that Super Bowl ring. And all these folks, so many of these folks who are, by golly, we you're disrespecting our military by not standing up and, and uh, saluting the flag and singing the national anthem and all that, are the same kind of folks who, well, it was like, did you see this? I thought, thought this was hilarious. You know, the, the, the big uh, uh, sort of conservative uh, speak out at Berkeley over the weekend uh, that Milo Yiannopoulos uh, was, was heading up fizzled out. But Milo shows up in Berkeley. There, there are hundreds of people who have gathered there on both sides of this, sort of maybe itching for a fight, but maybe also kind of wa wanting to watch the show. And he shows up wearing an American flag hoodie, you know. And, you know, other people are wearing American flag swimsuits. And they're, you know, they're, I, I mean, all these things that if you read how we're supposed to treat and respect the flag are not being followed uh, in, in this. Um, to me, the athletes are using the platform that they have to draw attention to something that they think is a serious issue. And this is nothing new. We can go back to Muhammad Ali, and I can remember what a contentious thing that was when I was a kid growing up. Uh, or or uh, the two tracksters, uh, uh, Carlos and um, yeah, in Mexico City, who stood on the, you know, in those days, in, in that day and age, that was too late for a young kid. I had to go to bed. It was even too late to get in the papers the next day. So it was like 24 hours later before we even knew that they stood, you know, on the on the metal podium and held their fists up and bowed their heads. And, and uh, oh, you know, that those were flashpoints. So these things have been, have been going on. It's interesting to me, though, that all of a sudden the NFL owners have – they realize that their product is under attack, essentially, because the president has said, don't watch it. Failing ratings, you know, that, don't watch them. They don't deserve to be watched. Fire the SOB. First of all, I never thought I'd hear that language out of a president of the United States. I, and I'm not a prude, trust me, on that stuff. Uh, I've covered the legislature for umpteen years. Believe you me, I've heard a lot and seen a lot worse than that. Um, but... I think the players have every right to do what they're doing. And people honestly have the right then if they say, you know what, my knickers are in a knot over that and I don't want to watch the NFL anymore, I'm going to boycott it. That's okay too. I do that on some things. 
I really have a hard time going to Chick-fil-A because of the owner's positions on uh, marriage equality in this country. I will concede I have four grandchildren, eight, seven, six, and five, and they like to go because of the playland, and so we do go from time to time. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, that's true. I boycott products that are, and this is exhausting too because you're trying to keep up with a list of these things that are produced by the Koch brothers, you know, the, 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 the uber right wing. I, I don't buy northern toilet paper anymore. I buy Charmin, you know, because I'm not going to support the Koch brothers. That's fine. This is a marketplace of ideas. But they have the right to do the things that they're doing, whether it's the Koch brothers saying, I think, you know, we, we want to dominate the the government from our perspective or whether it's athletes standing up and saying this is our platform we should take advantage of it and bring this to the attention of the american public i think the athletes are going to win that by the way that argument i think just to add a little bit to what arnold said first i think it's important to understand something from the, the legal point of view and that's that players have the right to do what they want to do within the bounds of their contract owners have the right to do what they want to do you know, if, if the NFL decides everybody's going to stand for the pledge and otherwise we're going to fire people, they can fire people. You know, it's always important to understand the First Amendment is all about government action. And when we're talking about things like the NFL, we're talking about private actors. I mean, until such point as like wherever the Raiders are now decides to imminent domain them to keep them from leaving again, you know, or, or whatever. I mean, it, it, until that happens and we have a state run NFL team, we're never going to have state action there. Um, I'm like you, Arnold. I think the athletes gonna kind of going to win this one. Um, but it, there's a larger conversation I know that ACLU has been involved with, with a long, for a long time, and that is what is patriotism. You know, we've, we're usually the people representing the kid who doesn't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance, the young man or woman who says, I don't want to stand for the anthem. Um, I don't want to give, you know, I don't want to be part of the public prayer, um, whatever it is. One of the things that I look at is, when I took, tend to look for that and say, what's patriotism? I tend to look and say, well, what's bravery? I mean, that's part of what patriotism is. And to me, bravery tends to be the one person, whether that's Ka uh, Kaepernick or whomever, who's doing the different thing and who's saying, I know everybody's looking at me. I know everybody's saying, what in the heck are you doing? Um, and I think that can, can go both ways. I mean, I, I see incredible amount of courage in what many NFL athletes and now MLB, NBA starting to do it. And I think it's interesting, in fact, that the week before Trump's comments, um, six players, if I remember correctly, AP looked at, uh, at it and said six players knelt or sat or otherwise did not participate in standing during the Pledge of Allegiance at NFL games. The week after, it was over 200. That's the power of counter speech, right? And that's also the power of when we perceive the government to be coming in and trying to put its hands in something in which it doesn't belong. And I think there, there are a few things that are more obvious than that than something like professional sports, right? Why, why is it that a president even thinks that that's his job to you know, tell the National Football League uh, how to manage players or players to, to deal with their owners? And yet somehow this, this is something that seems like the, the way now. But in all that, I think that real question of what is patriotism, like I said, to me, it's bravery. It's having honor and integrity. It's that if I'm going to stand for a Pledge of Allegiance, I stand because I want to stand, not because everybody else is standing, but because there's some meaning in that for me personally and some connection between what's going on in my heart and my soul and what I'm hearing in that pledge or hearing in that national anthem. I think that the most unpatriotic things or amongst the most unpatriotic things we can do is to stand without thinking, is to say, hey, I'm going to stand because everybody else does. I'm going to stand because I'm pretty sure that's what I'm expected to do. That's as unpatriotic as you can get, because if that's what you're doing, it means you don't even care enough to think about what it means to you to be an American, right? What does the pledge mean? Words have meaning. I mean, actually, go read the Pledge of Allegiance. Look at the lyrics to the national anthem. They're pretty big words. <laughs> they mean some really important stuff. And if we don't think about those things, I think, again, it, it creates that potential for incredible apathy. So to me, that's what patriotism is. It's, it's about having that courage and integrity to make the deep dive and say, this is what it's about for me. Personally, I tend to believe that calling attention to injustice is about as patriotic as it gets for two reasons. One is because it requires extreme courage. Second, because at the end of the day, 
you don't do it unless you love the country enough to be able to, to be willing to sacrifice to make it better. I mean, in calling attention to something, it's because you care and you want to see the country better. As a father, I can say right now, um, when I do the very difficult thing of actually trying to, you know, run down my five-year-old when he's going crazy and doing something he shouldn't do, um, and say, Brooks, Brooks, stop before you go out into the street and get hit by that car, it's not because I hate him. It's not because I'm mad at him. It's not because I think he's a bad kid. It's because I love him enough that I don't want him sit to see him get hit by the car. I mean, I think that's what it is for us as citizens, too. To want something corrected, to want it improved, to want to change something. I mean, it's really about deep love, and that's what patriotism is. James, I'm sorry, but everyone, I think, is in agreement on this, too. Um, I, you know. I've got a couple other issues in my hip pocket. Okay, here. Yeah. So instead of saying what they already said, I'll just let you. you. Sure? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, let's go something that's closer to home. That happened now a year, maybe a little over a year ago, uh, on the campus of OU, right? We had uh, a group of students who were on a bus going somewhere, right? and chanting uh, so a racist chant of some sort. I don't even remember the, the words that were they were saying, but it was clearly a, a, a racist um, uh, comment uh, and, and having a good time doing it uh, from what we could tell, right? Uh, and uh, the university responded by suspending them all uh, from, um, from being in school, closing down the fraternity, I believe, uh, was there anything else? I can't remember if there was any uh, other repercussions other than those were the two big ones that I remember, right? Appropriate or not appropriate? Is that, uh, is that, uh, is that what, and, and we can take this from two angles, right? Legally, what, was there some legal basis that allowed them to do that? And then more from the, is that the correct way to handle this situation where you have literally young people who, um, may or may not know the extent to which their words are har could be uh, harmful to others. Is this the appropriate way of doing this? So now let me throw that out in the mix and see what we get. You want to take the legal? All right. All right. Gonna, okay. Yeah, I think this this should produce controversy. I think we're finally going to get some disagreement. Um, and and yeah, because I can't imagine all of us will agree on this one. Uh, the SAE scandal the SAE incident, whatever you want to call it, and I, that's S-A-E, not S-E-E, which is what it sounds like when I've had too much coffee and I'm talking really fast. Um, you know, what this is about is, is yeah, this group of fraternity brothers and their dates um, who just, you know, apparently college is different than when I was there at OU because, you know, we went to parties and I can never recall that moment where it just seemed like the perfect time to, like, have a song about lynchings. Um, I, I mean... <laughs> that also wasn't my fraternity. So maybe SAE was different, but I just still to this day, I'm like, what, you know, why just, just literally, you know, what is the thought process going through somebody's head here? Um, but yeah, this wasn't just a racist chant or song. I mean, it was one that could definitely be construed as flat out threatening. I mean, it joked about literally lynching people, essentially implying that before you would see an African American become a fraternity brother in SAE, that you could quote, hang him from a tree. That was actually the rhyme that was used in this chant. So this wasn't just something that may, you know, used a racial slur somewhere or had a little bit of a, a racist con uh, commentary to it. I mean, this was very overt. And yet these young people are literally just chanting it and singing it on a bus and having the time of their lives. And what changed everything is, by the way, what's also changed everything in terms of things like police shootings, <laughs> and that's video the power of our cell phone because somebody videoed it and what would have otherwise been probably a fairly quiet bit of discipline from school administration saying, hey, don't do that. We got a report about this and that's not okay, but go on about your business became an absolute storm for the University of Oklahoma. And what OU did was several things, some good, some bad. I think the thing that is most concerning perhaps is that in many of their actions, they put their brand first and other things second, third, fourth, et cetera. And part of doing that was Bourne coming out very quickly and saying, we need to expel these students, we need to shut all this down, we need to get them out. Legally, as a state school, they really couldn't do that. 
Had the students protested, gone to court, I think they likely would have won. And I think they likely would have won amongst other things because I think the university would have had a hard time saying that mere presence on this bus or participation in this you know, was sufficient to actually create expulsion for what is obviously hate speech, but not necessarily illegal or unprotected speech. Now, like I said, some of it could walk the line on, on what we call true threats, which is one of the exceptions to First Amendment speech. But the university, um, I think in my estimation, I don't think they took the best legal tack there. And I say that because so much of what they did was to come out and try to convince the world what a great inclusive place they are, instead of looking at what was really going on. Um, and the fact that you had students such as a group called Unheard, who started coming out and saying, look, here are all the problems in your departments. Here are where African American professors aren't getting hired like they should, where there are all kinds of things that show us that this is not a racially inclusive uh, university. And the university solution was expel the SAE kids, loudly tell everybody they're doing it and how horrible these kids are and get rid of them and then go hire Jabbar Shoemate and create a title for him as I think vice president of diversity or something like that. And I've known Jabbar, he's a great guy. Um, but there was clearly scrambling going on. Mo ethically or morally, right, I think is the other way to look at this. I actually think there's something missing there too. Um, as an, an OU alumnus, this is something that really bothered me about SAE. And um, I'll put it this way, how, how many of you are 20 years or younger? Raise your hands. No, Arnold, you are over 20. Okay, in a second, all right. So, so quite a few folks, right? So the kids on this bus were about that age, 18, 19. Um, so how many of you are, let's say, 30 years or older? <laughs> all right, sorry to mess around with everybody, right? All right, so those of you 30 years or older, do you see the world the same way you did when you were 19? Probably not. Um, part of the mission of university and of the college experience is to change people, and it's to change people for the better. It's to confront ideas that they have. It's to make them think more sharply. It's to make them understand basically right and wrong better. I mean, there's a moral component to education, believe me. It's about getting people to understand folks who are different from themselves. One of the things about the reaction to SAE was it was essentially a, a tacit implication from OU that said, we don't trust enough in our own university system to be able to take these young men and women and actually expose them to something that might change their minds, right? But also to use what they did as an experience to bring everybody in that university together. I tend to believe that, you know, the remedy for that kind of thing is all about engagement. It's about bringing people together because if all you do is you shove people out into a corner, you're very like, unlikely to change any beliefs. I mean, if I'm one of those kids in SAE, am I any less racist now? Probably not. If anything, I'm, it's probably worse because you've just cut me off from one of the key experiences that could actually open my mind and make me think a little bit about what I'm doing. The tension though I think comes when we apply that to things like Charlottesville, when we apply that concept to increasingly violent movements and we have to start asking ourselves at what point does the danger of violent confrontation perhaps start to overrule or go the other direction? At what point is, for instance, the confluence of things like white supremacy um, in the private sphere and white supremacy in the federal government, when does that start to weight the scale so much that pretty soon there really is no free speech, right? Pretty soon there's a whole other form of tyranny. So I, I think that that's the tough part going forward, but that's, that's my diatribe on SAE. Maybe that'll get somebody to disagree here. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with the, um, that it could have been a really positive teaching moment for, for them. Um, I think that one of the things that, uh, we received a letter to the editor yesterday from the uh, KKK, and uh, we had a really nice open dialogue about racism in the newsroom. We were talking about it for about an hour yesterday. Um, those are my newsroom girls. So, uh, but, um, you know, it was a really great moment to be able to talk about the the national anthem and issues that are going on in the world. Um, there's a there's an organization I call I think it's called Bring It to the Table, and they just go to universities and they have a you know um, a sit down and have a discussion that's just 
you know, about racism and about issues that are fa young people are facing. Um, but I, I think that, like you said, they could have, um, I, I don't disagree with Warren in, in that zero toler tolerance of racism. I, you know, I think that that's what everyone should, should feel. But um, at the same time, like you said, they could have walked away e with even more racism in their hearts than before. So um, I think like organizations like Bring It to the Table could really benefit, uh, or universities could really benefit from that. I think we're approaching a, a moral, a, a, a big moment in this country because we're the only country in the world that condones free speech but also condones hate speech. The other countries that condone free speech have parameters on hate speech. And uh, I think we're going to see how far that's going to take us. Uh, in Germany, certain s it's forbidden to sing certain songs, to uh, publicly uh, make statements that support the Third Reich. And I'm sure there's other things that go on that I don't know about. The interesting thing, though, about that is, is if you paid any attention at all to the German elections this weekend, the far right is reemergent there as well and won seats in Parliament for the first time in, in who knows how long. I hate to say that I agree with Brady on a lot of what he had to say. I am really sorry about that. But, yeah, I, I thought it was a teachable moment that was sort of missed, too. It, not to downplay what they were doing. I mean, it was, it was horrific. Uh, it, it's interesting to me, though, in this, in this social media age in which we live in, the guys who were sort of at the forefront of that are going to have a scarlet letter basically in our society for the rest of their lives. You know, a boneheaded thing or whatever you want to call it that they did at 18 or 19, undoubtedly there was alcohol involved, um, is going to follow them the rest of their lives. You know, I, I, we can't warn you enough about what you say and do on Facebook uh, because it never goes, it never goes away. Um, but the same thing happened in Charlottesville. How many, there are groups, you know, who were, they were going frame by frame through the video looking and finding these folks who were engaged from the uh, neo-Nazi side, the white supremacy side, white nationalist side of the argument, uh, and were outing them. And people, you know, were losing their, one of the problems, of course, was there was a University of Arkansas professor who was outed, and it turned out it wasn't the professor. It was some knucklehead who was wearing an Arkansas engineering t-shirt or whatever it was, and uh, it looked sort of similar. Um, and that's a problem that, you know, that Arkansas professor probably is going to have to explain on down the line everywhere he goes, by the way, you may find something on the internet that suggests, but, um, so that's a, you know, that's a problem in exercising your free speech in this country these days. I think that's one of one of my concerns is that there's, there seems to be and maybe maybe I'm too young I don't know but um, there seems to be this growing sense of we need to exact retribution on people who say things we disagree with we need to get them fired from their jobs we need to find them we need to do something whether it's via a government mechanism or through some societal mechanism we're going to uh, put pressure on this company to fire this person to and, and that makes me a little uncomfortable it makes me a little weary that well I hate to use the, the slippery slope argument type of thing but where does that lead to next right and uh, and, and how do we deal with that um, we're going to open this up for questions from the audience now. And so if you have a question you would like to ask, we just ask that you come over to this microphone right over here uh, and ask your question in there. And our panelists will be happy to, I think they'll be happy to answer it. Yes? So anybody? We'll see if you can succeed where Professor Davenport Correct. Is. <laughs> exactly. This is one of your Hello? Can you hear yes. me? Okay. So uh, you guys mentioned Charlottesville a couple of times, but um, 
I wanted to know specifically um, if anyone on the panel, I'd like everyone to respond, um, if there is a moral equivalence between the groups that protested at Charlottesville on the side of the neo-Nazis and counter-protesters, including Antifa, though there might be a small distinction, I wanna hear those details. Um, I would say that um, there is not a moral equivalence because the neo-Nazis were advocating for large-scale genocide and mass violence against people, while uh, groups like Antifa and counter-protesters were trying to stop that, though, maybe in violent ways. So I'd like to hear uh, if you guys think that there's a moral equivalence there or not. Who wants to tackle that? All right. I'm really glad you asked that question because I think that that gets to both our history and to what we are beginning to deal with in a new way. Uh, if you notice, the press calls everybody a populist. You're populist if you protest and disagree. And I would say that there's qualitative differences here. That when the Nazis, or the neo-Nazis, are talking about fascism, they are talking about genocide. They do have maps and ideas about who they want to get rid of or move around, move populations around. Um, on the other side, people are countering that, and usually these are the same people that are calling for single-payer health care, for a better society, for more social investment in each other and in society. So I would caution people when they start to use the term populist to actually step back and see what the goals of each group are and where they come from. I don't think that they're morally equivalent. Yeah, and I agree. I, I don't see moral equivalency at all. Um, I, I'm, you know, d despite uh, our esteemed president talking about all those fine people um, in, in the white nationalist movement, I've not found one of those fine people. Um, when I look at them, I see a whole lot of people who, if we're really honest about it, are basically the scum of the earth. Um, they are not remotely fine people. I'm sorry. You know, the question with First Amendment law, I think, and in terms of then how do you treat these two groups that have very different moral equivalencies? I, I think that it begs a natural question, which is why do organizations like mine sometimes defend folks that we think are awful, right? The, the Nazis who wanted to march in Skokie, for instance, many decades ago. And it's not about moral equivalency. It's about whether or not you trust the government to determine that moral equivalency or lack thereof. Because for instance, with our federal government now, as we know, according to our chief executive, there is a moral equivalency between these two movements. There is a moral equivalency between people who say, hey, maybe we ought to all be treated fairly, and people who say, hey, I think I ought to kill you because of the color of your skin. That really doesn't ring very true, right? And that, I think that's really more what the First Amendment is about when, you, when we talk about concepts such as everybody has the right to speak. It's, not, I don't think, an endorsement that everybody has actually equal value in that forum in terms of their ideas. I think what it's really about is saying we don't trust the government to decide <laughs> which ideas are valuable. We trust ourselves as people to decide that. I think the only thing I would add there is just um, the only moral equivalency that one could identify is a result to violence as, a, as a, 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 an attempt to suppress opposing views, right? Uh, and even in that, I'm not sure you could say in that instance in Charlottesville, there was a moral equivalency, right? It was a member of the alt-right, if I remember, who drove their car into 17 people. Uh, that didn't come from, from the counter-protesters. So even in that, I'm not sure that you could say there's, there's a true moral equivalency there. Well, um during that SAE incident, you said that there was a teaching opportunity for that students, those students who were in probably about the age range, probably 18 to 20. But wouldn't you say that at that age, if you can spend thousands of dollars on an education, you can choose a major, you can um, you know, rent your own apartment, things like that, wouldn't you say that's an age where you can know that it's not appropriate to sing about killing someone because of their skin color? You know, we have um, sexual harassment training in college. We have all these codes of conduct that we're supposed to follow. We're expected to be adults at this age. So you would think that you were not supposed to mature young people to the point that the public educational system has already done so. 
No, I agree totally. Absolutely by that age, you know what you're doing. What I'm talking about in the teachable moment isn't saying there's no culpability there. In fact, far from it. What I'm saying is simply that a person has the capacity to change. And I think that exists at any age. And I think we have an obligation to try to do something to help change people's hearts and minds when they hold views that really call for the destruction of much of what we hold dear. Now, of course, there's a, a limit to that. And I think it's, it's kind of presupposed by some of what we talk about when we talk about white supremacists versus Antifa, right? When, and that's resorting to violence. You know, there are times in American history where that has happened, where there wasn't talking that was going to solve the problem. I mean, I, I firmly believe if we go back to the year 1860, um, you know, I would not be saying, gosh, if, you know, if these early, early folks who were about to secede had just, you know, had a good, let's, let's get around the table and really have a good mediation with, with the folks in the North. No, that wasn't going to solve the problem, right? Because you had institutions like American slavery that were so vile, so horrible, so destructive and deadly that you had people like John Brown who were willing to come do things like bomb uh, facilities, kill people if necessary, because they saw an evil so great. And honestly, if I were alive in that age, I'd have probably been with them. Um, I'm, even though I'm a man who does not believe in violence, I would probably have said the same thing they did. And that's that sometimes evil is so bad, you got to do something about it. Uh, you know, they have people advocating for violence against them, for them to still continue to pay so much to go to a university considered so prestigious, and yet these students who are advocating violence, all of a sudden they're still accepted and not given really a relatively correct punishment in terms of their actions. There's been a lot of success in um, opening up a dialogue between races and having a discussion. Um, I forget where it was, but they, they actually did that. They brought in the Black Student Association and they had a discussion about it. Um, I think that is um, where a lot of our responsibility lies as educators, is that we're supposed to even, uh, you know, everyone's coming from different backgrounds, um, especially rural, really rural towns in Oklahoma, um, where that may be like kind of the norm, um, even though it's not acceptable. But our job as educators, especially from when they're coming out of this um, small town mentality to a, u a university or college, our job as educators is to open up their minds and, and provide those different experiences and different um, backgrounds and the knowledge about that. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was watching something on 60 Minutes. It was kind of touching on what you were talking about, about it being too dangerous, ex inciting violence about how freedom of speech has um, had people in such fear of retribution that they're afraid to actually speak out for their beliefs. And one of basically their panel that they assembled said that they ble believed it became too dangerous if it was inciting hate. Um, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty interesting uh, too. You know, we, uh, I see it here in Oklahoma, at least, as somebody who sits on the left of the political spectrum in a state that's far to the right, generally speaking, uh, that people, there are a lot of people out there who are more sort of mainstream and on, on what I would consider to be my side of the aisle than have the courage to speak up right now. And I know that because we have events from time to time and people will show up and they'll go, oh my gosh, I didn't know there were that many people who think like I do in Oklahoma. And um, there is a fear, but some of it is, some of it is sort of a, a tribalism that we just naturally have, I think. And that is that uh, people like to feel like they're part of the, part of the team. You know, you, you, lots of people wear their thunder shirts around. You know, they, they want to feel like they're part of the team. They root for OU football or OSU football or, you know, whatever it might be, and they feel like they're, they feel like they're part of the team. And there, it, there is a fear. A lot of people, there's sort of a polite society, I think, in Oklahoma approach, and it's, and it's some of it maybe a little bit of southern roots that we have, that uh, there are certain things you don't really talk about in polite society, and a lot of it is fear that somebody else is going to shout you down, uh, and you're going to lose friendships and, and so forth. I know I've lost some friendships over things like that. Um, is it is it dangerous dangerous enough to 
incite violence. Yeah, probably in some circumstances it is. I've not encountered that, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, I Most of the times I find people, we just can't understand how the other person can possibly think the way that they think. There are a lot of Okie, f- including family members, that I just can't, I can't for the world understand how they see the world the way that the way that they do. But um, Bill Maher, if you guys have ever watched him, he's a very interesting uh, comedian and and somewhat of a provocateur, I guess. But I wrote down something that he said recently because I thought it fit to all this. And he's and he was talking about um, he he really it was a little bit of a take on something that I grew up with my mother. My I wish I had a dollar for every time my mother said, "Don't let somebody else do your thinking for you." And I didn't really understand the wisdom of it until I got older, and, and, I, and I came to understand what she was saying. Bill Maher puts it in these terms. He warns about us, because we have a susceptibility as human beings to, to sort of become susceptible to groupthink. And he says, one reason our politics is so screwed up is that it's gotten so tribal. So I would encourage you to let go of whatever fear or concern you might have and push back a little bit. I think your courage actually would embolden some others to say, you know, I, I can agree with you on this, but I don't necessarily agree on that. And it can sometimes spark a conversation. Yeah, I think as I, as we began the program, I think too often our conversations, especially our political conversations, there is no communication. There's, I've staked out this territory and I'm going to defend it, and you staked out your territory, and we're just talking past each other. Uh, in many cases, we're not really even talking to or at one another. We're just talking, uh, and there's no real communication going on. And I think to break down and to, uh, to move past some of these barriers that we see, you really have to take the courage to step out of your comfort zone. You have to, you know, if, if you're concerned that, you know, uh, something's going on, you have to find out and be involved. Make, you know, build relationships with people that you might not normally build relationships with to, to find out where is that common ground and, and, and what are people thinking of. There's, um, and I don't think it's unusual, there's, there's, there's fear amongst a lot of people just because they don't know what's on the other side. Uh, and, and if you can break down and build a bridge to the other side, sometimes you can, you can find that, hey, we're all human beings and we all, at the end of the day, want our families to be taken care of, we want uh, our, them to be safe, uh, and we want a community and in a, in a country that we can be proud of. All right, we are at the end of our program. I want to say thank you again to all of our panelists for being here. This has been, a, I think, a really great discussion, even though you spent too much time agreeing with one another. I'll work on that uh, in the future. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming out and attending and some great questions from, uh, from our students. So thank you for, for doing that as well. If you didn't get a chance, I'm sure there's still plenty of pizza and stuff to drink on this side of the the hallway here and our next uh, panel will be in October 24th I believe it will be on the, uh, the the role of science in making public policy and so I think that'll be a very interesting one to hear uh, if you look up here and you see this URL code uh, posted um, we have a survey that the, our, our part our funding partners ask you to fill out over this it helps us improve these programs uh, and continue justifying that they're worthwhile for them to partner with us on so take a few minutes and do that for most of our students I'll post this in D2L as well so you can find it there if you don't have a chance to to scan the URL code here and thank you all for coming the John Templeton Foundation through a grant from the Institute for Humane Studies you're graduating your parents are proud you're relieved but now what where are you going how about a college where you won't get overwhelmed and still get the full college experience Great. Let's start at Rose State. Rose State starts you out with a choice from more than 60 degrees and certificate programs. And Rose State offers compelling value in its two-year degrees. Consider the Rose State graduate feedback in a recent survey. 95% of recent Rose State graduates are employed. 95% would recommend Rose State to a friend. And 97% would get their associate degree if they had to do it all over again. But don't worry. 
students at Rose State are so much more than just a number. We'll help you along the way. With smaller class sizes, you can enjoy a hands-on academic lifestyle with a friendly, engaging, and experienced staff. With Oklahoma's first urban community college housing, you can live on campus and enjoy a bustling student life, from sports to an award-winning performing arts center. But at the end of the day, it's all about you and where you want to go. So what are you waiting for? Get started. Rose State College. Going somewhere starts here. All right, you're graduating. Your